Satellite sleep detection, does it work? A lot of people think it doesn't, so I'm going to try and put it in context. Is it fact or fantasy? And I have a second title, which is somewhat wordy. So really, it's a review of 15 years of work that MPA and others have been doing, including Infoterra, uh, on using SAR for sleep detection. I'm going to look at a few of the well-known areas, Angola, Gulf of Mexico, and the Black Sea, and then see how it compares to data we have for Greenland and New Zealand. And I'd like to acknowledge a few people. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Jeff Lawrence on the left and Mike King in the middle, who are my colleagues at MPA. Jeff will be familiar to many of you from BP. Uh, Dave Bamford, of course. Uh, I didn't have a, a photo of him, but I did get one from the archives. Apparently, this is when he was attending a uh, negotiating skills conference. And seems to be paying a lot of attention here. <laughs> uh, younger version, I don't know who his colleague is. Uh, and then I also have to thank uh, Lord John, of course, for kicking me out of BP about 20 years ago and making me work hard for a living. But uh, I, have, I have enjoyed it. Thank you, Lord John. Okay. Right. Who are MPA and where are we? Well, this is us. We're in a, a converted chicken farm in Kent. <laughs> we got rid of the chickens. Uh, it's a very pleasant environment. You can actually park your car uh, without being ticketed. And uh, we have some very nice neighbors one of whom, if I can point the right way, is uh, Winston Churchill, though he's not there now, but Churchill, just up the road. And also we have uh, Hever Castle. So if you'd like to visit, look at some data, we can take it to either of these places for a, a quiet lunch. So that's, that's where we are. And what do we do? Well, let's do it all in one slide. I'm gonna point this in the right direction. There you go. So essentially, NPA, became Frugro MPA two years ago. Uh, we're now part of the, the Frugro world. Uh, but essentially, they left us alone, and we, we're now carrying on as before, but with a lot more uh, people to play with. So it's a lot more interesting now with uh, Seismic and Geochem and GrabMag, et cetera. But essentially, MPA produce imagery. So any imagery you want, any scale, uh, come to us. This is Iconos, uh, just showing uh, natural color and false color. Then over the next one here, we have uh, Onshore geology, Mike Gerdes' team, produces structural maps and interpretation. We also now have 2D, 4D moves, so we can do some uh, subsurface uh, modeling as well. And the oil field subsidence, I won't uh, uh, talk about, but that's a new area where we can actually measure very tiny amounts of ground movement uh, using, uh, using multiple SAR passes. So that's what the company does. Okay, let's be honest. Uh, can SAR find Detect oil fields? Well, no. Let's be honest. Uh, what it does uh, is detect slicks. And we interpret those slicks in terms of their likelihood of being natural seeps. So what it does do, as Dave alluded to, is reduce source risk, but with a confidence rating on that. So a more correct title might have been satellite slick detection, some of whom may have originated from leaking oil fields. And in some case, basins, uh, you can be more confident, and others, you have to work harder. Okay, so these are sort of six key questions that are usually addressed. What is a SEEP? Let's have a definition. And uh, are they useful? Second question. What does SAR detect? How does it do it? What is SAR? What's the secret? Is, there, is it a black box? Well, it is, but it's a bit more than that. How do you prove a slick is a SEEP? That's a very important question. What array of tools do you need to validate a SEEP? How do you take the next step? You've got your SAR data from us or from other, other companies. What do you do next? And how successful has SAR mapping been? How many oil discoveries has it led to? Fair question. And the last one of the six is, is there a future? What next in SAR slick mapping? So let's have a look at some of those. OK, this is the definition of a SEEP, which uh, I, I still like. Uh, it's Robin Clark, Richard Cleverly from BP Days, is the surface expression of a migration pathway. I can look on the screen here. Uh, along which petroleum is currently flowing. In other words, it's the end of a migration pathway. So it's a geochemical marker. So your trap is leaking. Oh, wrong one. Let's go back. So it's, our premise is that all traps, except those with perfect seals, will leak some amount of oil and gas to the seabed. The oil and gas will either stay at the seabed, where you can sample it with various tools, shallow coring, etc., or you wait till the bubble plume takes it to the surface, 
And uh, what we do is sample or identify the slick. But if you've got that and you're confident with it, that is a very important, that's the end of your migration fairway. I think it's a very significant definition that. How SEEP's useful? Well, let's go back in time, 2000 BC, in the Indus Valley, they used it to uh, make swimming pools. Uh, you know, it was a wonderful uh, seal, so there's evidence of, of bitumen being used uh, back in those times. This was a, a rather interesting one, John Glorious gave me. Uh, naphtha filled mechanical horses. Now, who'd want to be uh, this chap here, you know, <laughs> facing uh, mechanical horses driven by naphtha? Fantastic. So that's what, what made the Persian Empire great. And then, of course, we have Sir, Sir Walter Raleigh, who was uh, obviously a geologist at heart, and he re realized the value of asphalt and claimed Trinidad for Britain and uh, Queen Elizabeth. So there's a whole host of reasons through time where seeps have obviously been useful or, or asphalt. Uh, derived from seeps. Right, moving on. Okay, onshore seeps and, and oil fields. There is a well-known association, and uh, let's just have a look at it. Uh, they were, of course, the precursors of most of the major discoveries, uh, for, even from the uh, 19th century up until uh, Bergan. So Sumatra, Spindletop, Oklahoma, I won't read through it, Persia, of course, that was the BP discovery back in 1908. Majid Suleiman, all found because there were seeps known in the area. That drew the explorers to the area. And this is a picture from Bergan, which uh, I rather like because the uh, geologists looking very pleased themselves on the left here. Uh, the drill is not looking quite so good. <laughs> and, uh, I, and I think he's ruined his fedora too. I mean, I like, I like, I like the hard hats they're wearing at that time. Very safety conscious. Okay. So, uh, moving on. So, of course, retail first. I mean, are these onshore seeps easy to find? Well, in my experience, uh, they're not. And uh, I've got a few slides from um, Zagros, where I did some work, gosh, many moons ago, as a young proto-geologist. Well, working in the southern Zagros, 200 kilometers north of Bandra Bas, in a Conoco concession. And we had a field of four geologists, supported by helicopters, looking for seeps and obviously doing some onshore mapping. <coughs> but uh, finding the seeps was, a, was one of the major objectives. We went right to the end of the survey, the last day but one. We still hadn't found any seeps, but we did find what appeared to be directions on a rock, saying something in, in Amharic, which we sent probably this way, uh, this way to town. And we got back to the base and thought, it can't be paint. There's no B&Q anywhere near this. It must be bitumen. So we went back to the same location. Luckily, we found this gentleman who was the, one of the donkey men wandering through there, and he took us to the only seep in the area. Uh, just asked the donkey man, he said, yeah, it's just around the corner. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we spent three months wasting a lot of money on finding any seep. So the secret of that is ask the donkey man. All right, so how does SAR work? Well, it's very simple. Essentially, uh, I, this, I don't think this, this one should be a movie, but essentially we've got uh, global coverage of very many radar satellites now and they would return to the same location about once every month. It varies depending on the satellite. So what you have is a huge database available to you. Uh, and the reason it works well is because any uh, waves that are flattened by oil, uh, the energy is reflected away from the sensor. So you get a black area on your image. So it's, it's that simple. It's, it's, a, it's a backscattering effect. But if you have uh, wave activity, Normal wave activity will send some energy back, and seawater, <coughs> excuse me, will normally come out as uh, as grey. So very simple. Uh, it's the effect, if you like, of oil damp damping on water, oil on troubled waters. <coughs> excuse me, I ought to stay of the year on the weekend, and I get a cold, which is wonderful. Uh, right now, there are three principal types of slicks, and we're not interested in in two of them. They're pollution slicks. Well, obviously, that's a very topical question. This is actually a picture of the Prestige, uh, the tanker that uh, sank offshore the, of Spain, I think about five years ago, and you can see the huge amount of oil that's already leaked back to the coast. Of course, it'll be dwarfed, I'm sad to say, by uh, the present BP spill. But we see a lot of dumping, illegal dumping, mostly by ships of uh, cleaning their bilges on our imagery. Seabridge slicks are what we want, and these are actually quite rare. So maybe 
I don't know, 5% of all the data we look at, we actually see what we want, seepage leaks. And if the, if the uh, wind drops to a certain level, you tend to get natural films, uh, algal, uh, and uh, you get all sorts of organic materials imaged in this way. You can actually uh, see a lot of information about current swirls, but it doesn't help you find the slicks. So you have to be very careful how you select the data. It's very weather dependent. And you have to get the right wind speed. You don't want it too calm, or you get too much of this, or if it's too rough, uh, the ocean will get cleaned up automatically. And what you really want, though, to prove to, to your manager to part with some money is usually a, a geochemical fingerprint. And this is really what I say is the end point of the exercise. Unless you can present your manager with sort of geochem evidence that your slick is a real oil, then uh, it's unlikely that he's going to uh, put, put money in your direction. Excuse me a minute. It says water, not wine. Okay, moving on. So how do we validate that SAR slicks are seeps. Well, we've got a six-step validation program, which we suggest, and it does derive, as Dave Bamford and others will recognize from BP days, but it still works. First of all, you need an aircraft. Now, in the good old days, in the 90, early 90s, BP had F-27s as ALF survey aircraft, quite, quite a high-quality tool, 50-seater commercial aircraft, in which they, in which they put the, uh, uh, the ALF laser in. But then, of course, Richard Clark came along and said, well, you actually just look out the window of a normal plane and save a lot of money. So we had another technique, which was called de Gama, but it really meant looking out of the side of a plane, and that seemed to work quite well. Uh, and you can sometimes see these sort of images very clearly. Well, obviously, <coughs> you don't need uh, any help if you're in the Gulf of Mexico uh, present day. But normally, a good slick would look like that. Then you need a boat to sample it. <coughs> this is not going to look good on the television, is it? Uh, and here is uh, actually T.D.I. Brooks's boat, the Powell, and uh, this is actually quite a small slick, which you probably wouldn't see, but you wouldn't actually see that uh, by satellite, but you need the boat to, to get the sample. Then, of course, uh, you want to map the seabed. Multi-beam is wonderful. Uh, since, since I've been involved in this, the quality of the data has become uh, exceptional, and you can see tiny uh, seafloor uh, so seepage, con seepage uh, induced features, carbonate mount, etc., fault scarps, which are excellent uses for targets for the next step. Uh, and at the same time, you can collect data from sonar and you can see bubble plumes and even, uh, uh, in this case, hydrate imaged uh, under the seabed. So then, the slick sampling. This is really the cheapest and easiest of all techniques. You go out with a hanky on a stick. Now, it's not ordinary hanky but it's a dichloromethane soaked handkerchief for any geochemist here. Uh, but that worked very well for us. Uh, it just needs to be dipped into the slick. Clearly, it's a nice, calm day. And you, you, you preserve it, you freeze it, and from that, you can get your geochem data. Then, of course, shallow coring, familiar, with, familiar to most of you. Drop your core, and if you're lucky, you might even come back, come back up with a visible oily core. And this was actually in some survey areas we did, uh, sadly to say, in Mississippi Canyon. So, uh, we could have saved the bother of coring it. All right, so that's step three. Step four is, if you really want to go to town, get a submersible down. Go to the seabed and have a look. Now, in 1991, Phil Vingo, being very generous, put me in charge of, uh, of a project to actually do that, to run all the tools available, including ALF, coring, slick sampling satellite, and also a submersible to get to the seabed and prove once and for all that seeps worked. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. And this is some of the data we got from the seabed. Uh, this is uh, from a video which John Simmons here has uh, prepared for us, a beautiful video called The Sea Punting Odyssey, and this is stills from it. This is actually a little mound on the seabed, and you can actually see the oil and gas just spurting up here. So it worked beautifully. Next step, of course, is to get samples. So this is the grab from the submarines, and this is if people you, you may know, Jane Thrasher and Roger Duckworth, who are actually taking the samples. And you can see there's a lot of oil here. This is what was grabbed from the submarine at, at, the, at the vent. Uh, and then run the geochem. And of course, it turned out to be a very nice carbonate sourced fingerprint, which exactly matched the oil. So this is back in 1991-92. And of course, the next year, John closed down the department. Well, you know how it is. Uh, Richard Hubbard came along and said, Frontier Basin is no longer important to us. Sorry, chaps. Uh, you know, off you go. But uh, the system worked, and, and the method, methodology definitely does work. 
And of course, the last step is to put it back into seismic. And uh, what you try to get is find the trap from which this is leaking. So you need to work out the plumbing system that gets you from the seep, and here's a nice fault, and there's some uh, obviously leaking trap. And that's a harder project, but that's where the geophysicists come in handy. OK. Right, now, a little bit of advertisement. Prugro can do all these things. It's not surprising. So we're the one up here. That's us. But of course, uh, shallow seismic can be done. Uh, we've got the boats for uh, multi-beam coring. Uh, and we have now uh, Geochem Lab, Geolab North. So all this technology now is within the company. Right, so let's think about geology. What are the controls on the basins? Well, but this is, again, going back to Chris Clayton and others. Uh, high sedimentation, sedimentation rates are very important. Or salt structures, you've got to have structuring in the basin, or faults over type is, active faulting. All these things um, are very important. So have I lost this? No, sorry, I'm going back a bit. Uh, are the main controls on seabage from, uh, from a trap. And also, high GOR oils and high API oils are also important factors. So those are... The, the sort of the base thing, thinking behind when you're looking at trying to uh, understand the data we're providing. And Duncan McGregor did a, a nice little, uh, if you like, list of leakage type, leaky basins from high leakage to medium leakage to low leakage. And it sort of makes a lot of sense. So the leakiest basins are those with, uh, with diapiric activity, or in this case with hydrases, could be the Caspian. Certainly basins with uh, active compression, active faulting, are all leaky. And, the less leaky basins are often the passive margins and the rift basins. And these are cases down here where you've actually got um, your fields have been breached. But it's a nice sort of uh, model to use. <coughs> now this is, um, from, again, from Jane Thrasher. Uh, actual example, Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, we saw big visible seeps over the, vertically over the, over the traps there. Uh, Gulf of Mexico, the big obvious ones are always uh, over the salt. And here is Cartagena, where you, you have shale diapies. Again, you see the big visible slicks over, over, the, over the thrust faults. But in most uh, basins, such as uh, North Sea, Halton Bunken, uh, it's more subtle. Here we did see uh, the coring found seeps. But in this basin, no, there was nothing recorded. There's no obvious migration pathway. So you have to think, because you don't see seeps doesn't mean there's no oil in your basin. But it gives you a clue. And this, again, uh, is a nice little graph. Self-evident, perhaps, but the more seeps you have, doesn't necessarily mean the bigger oil you've got. This is a, a, a thrust. Thrust basins have huge numbers of seeps, but traps are all quite small and smashed up. Uh, and often the biggest traps uh, often are those with the fewest seeps. So not every basin needs to have lots of seeps. Right, how are we doing? And this is, this is why I need uh, Gary's help. This is actually a little video uh, from an actual surfacing seep, rather nice. You can see the bubbles coming up here. These are pancakes of oil. The gas is bursting, and this is the slick left behind. Now, once you see that, it's like religious experience. Even Roger Sasson had to agree that seeps existed when we dragged him out to the Gulf of Mexico a long time ago. And from the, uh, from the air, this is Richard Clark's idea. Look out the window, and you can take this lovely photograph. This is a, a slick observed from about 2,000 feet. So in the right conditions, you can see these things in a low sun uh, from a light aircraft. <coughs> but the key thing is re repetition. And this is a, a nice little sequence from Venezuela, from Cuyaco Basin, just showing, uh, if you take multiple images, how you can get repeats, even in a basin that you perhaps not uh, initially think is prospective. So yeah, repeat is still, to, for us, the, the most important uh, characteristic. OK, cautionary tale number two. Not all point source slicks are seeps. Now, I, am, I will get to New Zealand in a minute, David. Don't worry. Uh, this is an interesting one, though, because uh, this is one of the airborne slick spotting surveys we did for Petronas quite a long time ago, 1991. We flew an airborne, an ALF survey, and there's Jackie Bannon there, my colleague. And we did the airborne survey. Had to have the right glasses, of course. Had to have the Ray-Bans, polarizing glasses. And the idea was to... Um, to survey the area. This is the client, this is Barney from Petronas. Now what we found one day was a huge point source slick. I mean, something that you know you to dream about, at least some for people like me do. Uh, this is a, you can see the emission point, you can even see some, what appears to be some residue 
coming out from the point. Now, we weren't stopping here, so we flew over it to get to our survey area, and then we came back four hours later. And it was this big. It was enormous. So you still see the points. They can sit spread, well, again, <coughs> for parallels, of course, in, in the US now, but it's, it's spread to that size. Uh, let's go back a bit, which was enormous. All in four hours, and you can see it's a beautifully, it was about 10 kilometers in about four hours. So I thought it must be a leaking pipeline. So we went to see Petronas, and uh, we pointed out where it was, which is here, just in La Buan. And But uh, there were no fields there. This is not on the pipeline route. Uh, and he said, no, uh, it's definitely not one of ours. So we were a bit st stumped. I thought, perhaps it is real. I presented it at a CPEX conference, and some kind soul said, uh, I can tell you what that is. That's a, a sunken diesel tanker, and I dive on it quite frequently. And uh, you've just rediscovered the location of it. Thank you. Uh, and the reason we found it was because there had been a quake the day before, uh, enough to wake us up in the hotel room in Kota Kinabalu. I think it was 4.5, and that's what had released the oil <laughs> from the tanker. So, it, you know, quakes and seismicity uh, accelerate seepage, in this case, leakage. But the principle remains the same. Okay. Getting back to data, that's our database. So uh, it's pretty extensive, 11,000 interpreted scenes. Um, from that, 100,000 slicks. Uh, and uh, the colored areas are the areas we've, we've recently been filling in. So we have data over most basins, uh, we think. Probably a few gaps to be filled in up here. But it's pretty good coverage. And this is at least dual coverage, and sometimes we're trying to get it up to f four or five times now. But it's only single wavelength radar. And... Uh, so that's not much you can use. There's no spectral data, but you've got size, you've got morphology of the shape. Uh, you've obviously got the wind current driving it, so you use that to, to work out if it's likely to be seepage or pollution. And you're looking for, for the context for repetition. So, you know, it's a fairly, it's, it's an experience-led uh, skill, and Jeff Lawrence, I have to say, is probably one of the leading interpreters in the business. Now, we also have onshore seeps, because Fugo, uh, of course, own Fugo Data Solutions, and they have this lovely onshore database, so we can combine the onshore seeps and the offshore seeps, make it even more interesting. And here are some of the repeats. I won't give you the color scheme, because I've obviously got some friends in the audience, brackets competition, but essentially, uh, if you look at the green stars, that gives you a clue to where we've got, obviously, uh, very leaky basins which repeat and show it very clearly on our database. And if we just move on to the next slide, these are probably the obvious areas where SARS works very successfully. <coughs> we, uh, we, the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico, Venezuela, uh, I've mentioned, West Africa, Black Sea, also Caspian, uh, Rift Lakes, Red Sea, Arafura. So that's, if you like, is our, would be our sort of ch uh, uh, examples where we know that the uh, system works very well. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't work anywhere else, but it just means that's the easy places. So let's have a quick look at the Gulf of Mexico. This is obviously uh, the seepage data. The points are all slicks, different color coded depending on the confidence levels. So a huge amount of natural seepage here. I mean, I know it's, not, it's, it's no comfort to say that there's a calculation that there's 450,000 barrels of oil per day leaking naturally into the Gulf of Mexico, into the US part, and an equal amount in, in the Mexican part. Now, that still doesn't help the problem with, uh, with the spill, but it does demonstrate that there's natural leakage as well in the, in the system. Okay, so that's, and this is what they look like. I mean, they are very easy to spot. And uh, if you, you know, we did this work some years before the deep water drilling, and we've got a lot of coincidences of, of uh, repeating seeps with, uh, with present day discoveries. So it works very well here for, for the obvious reasons. Yes, all those components I mentioned work. It's got overpressure, it's got a very rich source rock, it's got salt. Everything you want works in this basin. And here's just a sequence to show some detail. Uh, just taking a corner of the uh, deep water, Keithy Canyon. And these, the, the green are the slicks and uh, the little tadpole things are the heads of the slicks. And you see they just, they all come on the intrasalt basins. They're all, they're coming almost consistently out on the intrasalt highs. It's a very intriguing and consistent pattern. And where you don't see uh, seeps, uh, sometimes you can explain it quite easily by the fact that there's a big salt plug. So the oil is actually being deflected uh, to the side of the, of the salt. So it's, this is where a basin where it's beautiful. Uh, quickly look at Mexico. This is a surprising area. This is an area we looked at about uh, 
six years ago for Pemex, and uh, in huge amounts of deep water, up to 3,000 meters, you've got the same fantastic repeating seeps. And this is the imagery, just to show you what it looks like. You put the imagery over the bathymetry. Moving on, that's the actual data without the interpretation. And that's showing multiple repeat seeps. This is actually in, uh, right in the Campeche Knolls, uh, way out into the uh, deep water, 3,000 meters of water. And the interesting thing is, even in that data, depth of water, we found slicks. So depth is not an uh, inhibitor to seeing slicks. Uh, and what was even more surprising is when, this is Ian McDonald, uh, and uh, he was Texas A&M, and then he then went to, 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 took a camera sledge to the seabed and took some fantastic images of what he called asphalt dikes. There's so much oil emerging uh, in that area that it forms volcanic-like dikes on the seabed. So a fantastic area. And I'm sure that will become a discovery area, assuming they have reservoir, uh, adequate, adequate reservoir. Okay, um, quickly through this one. Black Sea was mentioned. Uh, I tend to disagree with Neil because we think there's a source rock here because we see a lot of repeating seeps in the eastern Black Sea. A uh, uh, reservoir seal may be a problem, but uh, we would say there's plenty of source rock here. And there's a nice sequence of pictures here which shows, I think we've got 10 different scenes. And if you keep your eye on, <laughs> on this area, you see how they repeat in different shapes on different days. See this? Now, we didn't see that initially because we only had two passes. When we went up to five, it's suddenly we, we got this picture. Here's the stars, the Silver Star Award. So if you do more passes, you can get more success. Okay, quick look at uh, Angola. It's been mentioned. That's the data we, we actually generated before the round. This is back in 98, 99. Uh, those are the fields that have now been filled, found, of course, block 31, BP 32 total. And... Uh, uh, if you put the slicks back on top, it's a pretty good match. So that's a very nice example of how uh, work, SAR work done very early on uh, got uh, companies able to reduce risk at an early stage. Okay, moving on. That's an example from uh, one of the East African lakes. That's actually Tanganyika, the Cape Columbus seep. <laughs> Multiple images, but just showing that how effective it, it can be also in uh, inland lakes. And I know in Patera done some nice work in Lake Albert on the same area, in the same system. Okay, we're getting around to Greenland. I got five minutes? Yeah. Thank you, David. What a gentleman. Uh, that's our coverage of Greenland. Um, the, we've got very good coverage west and east, and we're just about to uh, fill in the, the southern part. So we've covered the actual um, uh, 2009 blocks. So we have data now, multiple coverage data. And uh, of course there are seeps there, the Baffin Bay seep. This was actually sampled by Roger Duckworth back in 1990, when ALF was first being sort of in its, you know, its teenage years. We were looking for, for areas to, to prove the seeps were. This is actually taken from an aircraft in Baffin Bay. It's a well-known seep, Scott Trough, just here. And these are some of our results of okay, color-coded, uh, pink blues and pale blues, different rank seeps. And I've got some data that I can show you, some example. So quite a lot of slicks. But what's interesting is that we also got a very large cluster, oh, wrong one, very large cluster here, which was uh, surprising to us, because this is quite a difficult area. It's cold water, you've got layering, you've got lots of things to, it's not so easy in cold waters in Arctic terrains to find slicks, so we were quite pleased with this. And that particular cluster there certainly got the attention of uh, lunar oil. And uh, when you look at it more closely, there is a lot of, it's a huge slick here. I think this is 100 by 100 kilometers. So it's an awful lot of oil. Now, we weren't confident enough to say that was a real seep. It looked too good to be true. So we said we weren't sure. Uh, but it's certainly uh, of, of geological interest. So Greenland and the Arctic are not that easy. They have problems because there are algal blooms. You have, you have, uh, you have downwelling. You have, uh, you have layering in the water column. So anything you see is quite an achievement. So we were quite pleased with the data we got in those areas. So it's not as easy as... Uh, the Gulf of Mexico or Angola. Okay, New Zealand. I said I'd get around to it. Uh, this is um, the, the main basins, obviously in a free air gravity base. And uh, we've got quite an interesting data set. That's our coverage here. Uh, each square is, a, is one footprint of, of data. That's 100 by 100 kilometers. 
And uh, here are some of the results. We've, I've just picked out the better ones. So obviously, in this case, the pink are outranked the, the dark blue. And where you see a star, it means we've got a, a repeat. So an interesting few repeats around this basin, which I'll just zoom in on, which is the Rao Kamura Basin. Get it right. And that's a, a very interesting little basin, because it's only, only discovered in the 1980s. Nobody knew it was there. And we've got an interesting group of slicks. Again, they're quite low confidence, but there are some repeats in it. Uh, and that's what they look like in detail. These are the blocks that the crown minerals uh, have, have put up. And if you look at a bit more detail, it's gets more interesting, because it's, it's got some elements of a leaky basin. It's got, obviously, you've got uh, the edge of a tectonic plate here, so uh, you've got a plate boundary. Uh, this is a back arc basin. Here's the actual basin. You've got volcanics to the west. Uh, but it's quite deep. You've got 11,000 feet of sediment, Cretaceous and tertiary sediment. Uh, you've got water depths down to 3,000 meters. There are onshore seeps. And there's lots of uh, faults and potential leakage pathways. And the Crown Minerals, or uh, GNS, have done a very good job. The reports are available through their websites. And they've actually analyzed some of the seeps. And you've got some geochem signatures. So this is the medium wax oil. And this is the uh, lower wax. Uh, most of the oils are late Paleocene white power. So they're marine oils, low wax, low sulfur. But there is some wax in the, uh, the more uh, in the Wangai formation, which has more uh, land material in it. So that's very good to have this information. Yeah. Yeah. And people actually can, can visit the seeps. And on the seismic data, they actually found some correlation with some of our data. They looked at this line here and found uh, there was some uh, slicks actually fitted quite well. This is uh, some of the reservoir fasces they were identifying. And uh, they've got all sorts of pos possible turbidite mounds and uh, little faulted uh, migration pathways. And we, we saw slicks in areas which did, in broad terms, correspond with targets they'd identified. Same thing here. They've got DHIs, they've got bright spots, uh, pinch outs. And don't forget, this is a, a very new basin, hardly been uh, looked at, yet we do have some slicks which, which make sense. OK, to wrap up. Does SAR work? Well, obviously, in the easy basins, it does. So the list on the left here are the ones where, uh, which it's a no-brainer. Uh, they, have they been tested? Yes, most of them have now uh, been sampled. Certainly, the ones with yes, not, all, not always by us. Petra Bru have tested Trujillo. Uh, Angola has been tested and sampled with, by Brooks. I know Lasmo, Ray, Ray Archer has been to uh, Iranian Caspian. So most of it, those are actually fact. So what's my conclusion? Well, the SAR can be effective in deep water, leaky basins, with a black oil jar. It doesn't work so well with gas, it doesn't work for gas, and condensate would be, would be a challenge. But it also works for, for lower leaky basins, but you have to work harder to get results. But you look for gas chimneys, pockmarks, you look for other data to collaborate, collate with it. And Rakumara is a good example of that. But a prolific seepage doesn't mean uh, you've necessarily got a major Oil field, you have to think about all the other elements of the petroleum of system. But it has worked brilliantly in Angola and Deepwater Gom. The database has also identified, our database, that places like Campeche in the Cariaco and the Eastern Red Sea are, are surprisingly prospective in terms of seepage. Uh, and so it's an effective screening tool, but it has to be integrated with seismic. It's, it's the first step of, of the whole process. And I, what's new is that there are new one meter, five meter resolution SAR platforms available, Cosmos SkyMed, Terrace IX, RadarSat 2. So this brings a whole uh, business of much, you define much smaller slicks and you can be much more precise about the uh, about type of oil you, you like, like you to image. Okay, that's it and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, sorry for the copying. Thank you. Um, time for one or two questions. Yeah, please. Anybody except Nick. Yeah, yeah it's just tacked right at the end of your last slide. You said image. You said and possibly gas seeps. Can any work be done on gas seeps at this okay. stage? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, no, not not with SAR because uh, you need something a bit cleverer than that because you have to get a slick to image. Uh, that's what you're detecting. So. 
to get methane is what you're asking. I think you need uh, some airborne systems, which I could suggest. There are various uh, uh, airborne devices that might capture methane, but not, not with SAR. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Oh, one, one more back there. Uh, as I uh, hear from you, there is a uh, affection from salt towards uh, the slicks. I need more elaboration about the affection of the salt. And moreover, I want to ask uh, why you don't validate the, the, uh, the SAR data in Red Sea, since you are repeating the data and there is available seismic before. And uh, other, you know, currently Saudi have uh, seismic projects and Egypt have data in the Red Sea. Why you don't validate the SAR data there? Think quite that. Could, could you sort of simplify? I didn't quite get all of that. Well, I think one of the questions was on your next book, one yeah. last slide. The Red Sea was an example of something that didn't didn't work. Yeah, not okay, yet. Well, so, okay. All right, this one. You mean? Yeah. Not yet validated by us, but uh, Saudi Aramco may well have validated it. We provided the SAR data <coughs> two years ago, but we don't know if it was been validated. Maybe it has. Perhaps I should say, uh, put a know. question mark on that, yeah. as opposed to no. I said not yet. Okay. But it, we did find some repeating seeps, which is the point I was trying to make. Okay. Does that help? And what is the affection of the salt towards the uh, data? The salt? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I would expect that the leakage path that followed the salt, and there were some I know near the Dalak and Palestine Islands, which are, called, are salt called islands. And most of the seeps do tend to come associated with the salt. So there is an association, yes. You'd expect to see it with the salt. Okay, just one more, please. Yeah, just um, going back to um, uh, David's drinking challenge. Have you done any work in the Fal Falklands Basin? We have, and uh, see me after. <laughs> That's a good answer. Okay, thank you, Alan.